my father and I used to play cribbage. And uh, we were sitting there playing cribbage, and we had the radio on, listening to the radio, and all of a sudden came on. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. I can remember I was just furious and I, I didn't calm down for days afterwards. My name is Charlie Chapman and I was in World War II in the U.S. Navy. I was a quartermaster third class on the USS Indus, AKN-1, which was a net layer throughout the South Pacific. I'm Jean Hagen Chapman from Chelsea, Massachusetts. I'm the wife of Charles Chapman, U.S. Navy veteran of World War II. When I uh, went through the system they had for drafting at the time, I could uh, be drafted and I had my choice of different organizations. I always wanted to be in the Navy. First thing we did when we went into the Navy was to go to boot camp, which was uh, Coddington Point, Rhode Island. For three months there, you you trained at Company 974, which was part of the 9th Battalion. They gave us a bunch of tests while you were there. I, I managed to get a good mark in some of my tests, so they allowed me to go to whatever school I wanted to, and I wanted to go to Navy Diving School, which ended up to be Pier 88, New York, where I spent three months learning to be a deep-sea diver with the uh, big heavy helmet and a big suit. My girlfriend was in Somerville. She belonged to the Drum and Bugle Corps there. Her family was involved with the VFW. Uh, the weekends were for the family, the kids, to get together. So I met Charlie at her house in Somerville, and for many, many years, the group stayed together. Charlie's friends from Somerville, and uh, my girlfriend and myself. The night I met her, I knew I wanted to marry her someday. You know, we were 15 years old at the time. <laughs> Four years later, we did get married. We got married in uh, 1943. When I was in Navy diving school, I come home on the weekend and we got married. And my good friend John Hogan, he always said, teenage marriages never last. They don't last. And uh, we were a teenage marriage. We're only 67, 66 years now, so going on 67. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll last. Keeps me alive anyway. I was assigned to to a ship, USS Indus AKN-1. We went to Philadelphia Navy Yard to wait for our ship with the crew. From there to Baltimore, where we picked up the ship, we went on a shakedown cruise with it down to Norfolk, Rhode Island, loaded up with nets, and from there we went south to Panama and through the Panama Canal.
Manus Island and the Admiralty Islands and knitted all the little islands together there, which took three months. We went up to a lady in a convoy, and we anchored in Tacloban Harbor next to an oil tanker. And one of the interesting stories there, I was a quartermaster third class, which is on the bridge of the ship. I kept the log. And I remember one time I was on the bridge on off time, and I used to talk to Captain Highland, because he was a fine gentleman and nice to talk to. And uh, next to us was an oil tanker without oil in it, had water in it instead. And a YMS, which is a yard mine sweeper, made of wood, tied up next to it. While the captain went arrange to arrange for the water, the Jap plane came in and bombed the thing, trying to hit the oil camp, uh, landed right in the middle of the YMS and blew it all to pieces along with a crew of 25. Pretty soon the captain of the, that had been the uh, captain of the YMS came aboard my ship and uh, reported to Captain Highland that his ship had been lost. He was a nervous wreck and I, I always thought it was a great trick on Captain Highland's part. He put the man at ease by saying, oh, did you get the water? And when you think of it, his ship the ship is gone. What did it matter whether we got the water? And the incongruity of it caused them to just break up and laugh. I think when you're thrown into the middle of something like that, you kind of live day to day. We had rationing. Each family was allowed just so much. We had uh, stamps that you took to the butchers. Sugar and other quantities of foods were rationed. Well, after the war, too. Three ships that were sunk. The uh, men, I think, all together amounted to about 300 men. But there were all these sailors floating around in the water with uh, light blue shirts on, blue dungarees, and no heads. And every time I'd go to wash my swab out at the stern of the ship, there was always a couple of guys bobbing around in the water there. And the thing that bothered me about being there and getting killed was the fact that you wouldn't be picked up out of the water, they'd leave you. So the 30 days we were there, these guys never got picked up. Everybody just had to get involved in one way or another, whether it was volunteering with groups, working to get their boxes off to the servicemen, or rolling bandages for the Red Cross besides working and having the regular family life. So my reaction to, to, to dropping the A-bombs on Japan was, thank God, because I knew I was going to be an ammunition ship, and we knew there were going to be a million casualties. These people were quite capable of putting up one hell of a defense at their island, and we knew it. So when those two bombs dropped, admittedly it took 50,000 people, the, uh, it was better than, than uh, getting blown to pieces for no reason. So the Japanese had their peace, we had their peace, and the war was over. So my, my thoughts were, thank God they dropped them. And if I could go back in time today, back in time, and I had the, the opportunity to drop them, I would do it. Would I do it today to the Japanese dear now? No, of course not. They're our friends now, but they weren't then. We received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. And I can always remember it was an aircraft carrier, and as you're approaching this warp, the it was an empty wharf, and by the time the thing got into the wharf and tied up, there were thousands of people there, there were bands playing and everything, from an empty wharf to a great welcome. From there I took a train home, so my wife met me at the station, and we, I was very happy to get, get survived the war. Didn't expect to, but I did.